You are now listening to MedEd Talks Primary Care, a Vindico Medical Education production. To view CE information and claim credit, log into MedEdTalks.com and search Familial Chylomicronemia Syndrome, a multi-specialty guide to early recognition and novel therapies, or click the link in the notes section of this podcast. Now, here's your host, Dr. Bajaj. Hi, I'm Dr. Archana Bajaj. I'm a clinical lipid specialist and assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also the director of clinical trials at the Penn Preventive Cardiology Program. This is the last of a three-episode series titled Familial Chylomicronemia Syndrome, a multi-specialty guide to early recognition and novel therapies. For this episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Alan Brown. He is a professor of cardiovascular medicine at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine and past president of the National Lipid Association. Thank you for joining me, Alan. Thank you, Archna. I'm excited to be here. And it's great to have you. So today we'll be discussing new and emerging therapies for treating patients with FCS. So Alan, just to start off, can you maybe describe the current challenges that patients with FCS faced with the current treatment and management approaches? Sure. You know, as we have discussed in our other episodes, this is a really devastating disorder that is primarily caused by non-functioning of lipoprotein lipase. So the patients have high levels of chylomicrons in their blood and very high triglyceride levels. Traditional therapies for lowering triglycerides don't really have a significant effect in these patients. So whether it be statins, fibrates, omega-3 fatty acids, they continue to have triglyceride levels close to 2,000 milligrams per deciliter, which is in the range, of course, that puts them at significant risk for pancreatitis. So the major difficulty is for the patients are recurrent episodes of pancreatitis. The only treatment up until recently was a very strict low-fat diet, less than 20 grams of fat per day or approximately 10% of calories from fat. And if they go off their diet even slightly, many of the patients will get an episode of pancreatitis. So that is a draconian diet. It's difficult to maintain. And uh, there are a lot of issues associated with that, including uh, how it affects the social life of the patient's and the fact that they often have to prepare their own food to go out to any events. As I mentioned, traditional lipid-lowering therapies are ineffective because despite aggressive medical therapy, they don't get a big difference in triglycerides. And, of course, having chronic recurrent episodes of pancreatitis over the course of their life, as well as low-level abdominal pain, generalized fatigue, some brain fog associated with the severe hypertriglyceridemia, really affects the patient's social life and has psychological effect on the patients. It's often associated with depression. These patients are often accused of being alcoholics, which they are not, and even get unnecessary surgeries such as cholecystectomy and uh, other operations because uh, nobody can quite figure out what's going on with them. So They have difficulties with getting an initial diagnosis. Once they get the diagnosis, they have to follow this very strict diet. And finally, there are a lot of psychosocial effects of having the disorder. So we're excited that now there are some treatments that are effective for these patients. Yeah, I I can't agree more with more with you. You know, if anyone's ever met one of these patients, I mean, just the chronicity of the the disease is such a stress on on their lives. It's like you mentioned, a very very challenging diet to follow, and just the chronic and anxiety and stress that's present. Of you know, if you fall off that diet, there is that risk for acute pancreatitis. So, tell us more about some of the new and emerging therapies that are being investigated for FCS and how they differ from our prior traditional additional ages that we've used for triglyceride lowering in the past. Yeah, this is very exciting because I always say there's very few lipid disorders that keep lipidologists up at night. This is one of them because we keep getting a call that those patients are in the emergency room. So having therapies that are effective are really is really a breakthrough. So there are two uh, therapies that target APOC3. So it's interesting that APO C3 inhibits binding of APOE, which is where remnants such as chylomicron remnants and VLDL remnants bind to receptors in the liver, unlike LDL, which binds via APOB. 
So it turns out when you remove ApoC3, you increase the binding of ApoE. Normally, intact chylomicrons cannot bind to the liver receptors as opposed to chylomicron remnants, which are formed from the effect of lipoprotein lipase on chylomicrons. These patients don't have functioning lipoprotein lipase, so their chylomicrons are not becoming remnants, and they remain in the circulation. But when you remove ApoC3, probably that enhanced binding by remnant receptors allows the liver to take up intact chylomicrons, and this is likely why triglyceride levels go down in these patients. It's a little unclear which receptor exactly picks up intact chylomicrons when you remove ApoC3, but this is the current thinking about the physiology of it. The treatments are targeted to remove ApoC3. The first one that was actually approved by the FDA in December of 2024 is an antisense oligonucleotide called olazarsin. It targets ApoC3 messenger RNA by binding to the messenger RNA and stimulating the liver cell to turn on an RNA so that destroys the messenger RNA for ApoC3. Uh, the second one, which is currently under review by the FDA, is plozacerin. It is an siRNA or a small interfering RNA, which is a double-stranded oligonucleotide that stimulates destruction of the messenger RNA. They both have similar mechanisms in that they reduce ApoC3, uh, but slightly different platforms, as I described. And and development of these therapies, it's it's sort of an interesting story going back to the genetics and realizing that we do have those genetic studies showing, you know, with ApoC3 loss of function variants that you do see uh, lower triglycerides in those patients, then again, supporting this uh, pathway for treatment of high triglyceride disorders. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, let's start with olazarsin. What What is the data thus far on olazarsin in patients? So Olazarsen did a study specifically on familial chylomicronemia patients who had genetically proven FCS. And they had uh, 66 patients enrolled in the study, all with genetic variants associated with FCS. Uh, 22 of the patients were placed on the 80 milligram dose, 21 of them on the 50 milligram dose, and 23 were uh, placed on placebo. The baseline triglycerides in these patients, just to give you an idea of what they're dealing with, was 2,630. Then the 80 milligram dose had a mean reduction in triglycerides of 43.5% at six months. So for these patients, keep in mind that even with a really strict diet, we don't get anywhere near that kind of reduction in triglycerides. And certainly not with the prior agents of fibrates or statins either in, in F patients, just to make that clear. So, so 40%, 43% is, is huge. Right. And that was a mean reduction. And the, the more exciting part was there were 11 episodes of pancreatitis in the placebo group and only one episode in the treatment arm, which is, of course, what we're really worried about, which is improving the quality of life for these patients. So that was very exciting. Now, plazacerin published a, a study that was similar using the siRNA. Uh, it was called the Palisade trial. They had 75 patients, and they had a little different approach to looking at the results. They had uh, measured the median triglyceride drop. Their baseline triglycerides were 2044, so even though they weren't all genetically proven, they had persistent chylomicronemia, clinically similar to FCS patients. And the median drop on their 25 milligram dose of triglycerides was 80 percent, 78 percent median decrease uh, on the 50 milligram dose, and then the placebo had only a 17 percent reduction in triglycerides. They had an 83 percent reduction in episodes of pancreatitis, and similar to balance, the severe and serious um, adverse events actually occurred less in the plazacerin group than in the placebo group. So safety looked uh, quite reassuring in both trials with both olazarsin and plazacerin. Right. And uh, how, how would you say, you know, just looking at the treatment paradigm for FCS and how it's evolving before our eyes and, you know, what are your thoughts on how these therapies might change our clinical approach to patients with FCS? Well, I think um, both of these therapies look like they're going to be very effective as an addendum. 
It doesn't look like they'll be able to abandon diet, unfortunately. Whether or not uh, the patients will be able to liberalize their diet a little bit is still a big question mark. I think that's an important point to note because, you know, in these clinical trials, the patients were all counseled to maintain the low-fat diet as they continued with dosing with the study medication. Right. I'm excited about the fact that the pancreatitis episodes went way down. And I think many of these patients are kind of pre-programmed to avoid eating fat. I don't think it'll be a huge issue for them to maintain their diet because fat has been like ant abuse for them. If they do eat fat, they get pancreatitis. So they've become pretty good at it. Uh, but time will tell whether they could liberalize their diet. But certainly at this point, we want them to maintain the diet aggressively and, uh, the fact that they actually get a significant reduction in pancreatitis is huge. And I think over time, uh, th that should really improve the quality of their life. Over the short term, many of the patients have already been extremely excited, some of them in tears, because they see their triglyceride levels coming down significantly and they feel better. It's really life-changing for some of our FCS patients where they're used to, you know, every year having perhaps multiple episodes of acute pancreatitis and now finally having a therapy that can actually alter that. What are your thoughts on, you know, we see some differences in terms of the inclusion criteria for FCS, whether or not we need genetic confirmation for FCS. And maybe you can also speak towards what the FDA uh, uh, indication looks like for Olazarsen in terms of uh, genetically versus uh, clinical diagnoses for FCS. It's somewhat gratifying that the FDA didn't require genetic testing. And so they do, in the label for Olazarsen, it is indicated for familial chylomicronemia syndrome, but they leave it up to the clinician to make that diagnosis. As you know, we have the North American scoring system, which allows you with primarily clinical data and an ApoB level to try and make the diagnosis. And uh, if the score is over 45, then the patient has likely FCS and over 60 definite FCS. So that's helpful. I think, as you know, there are a group of patients who are genetically negative, but act exactly like FCS patients. They have persistent hypertriglyceridemia, re recurrent pancreatitis, lack of responsiveness to traditional triglyceride lowering therapies, and there are no secondary causes of their severe hypertriglyceridemia. So before we did genetic testing, we would have called those patients FCS. So whether you label them as persistent chylomicronemia or functional chylomicronemia syndrome, uh, they deserve to be on treatment because there's no other options. So those functional FCS patients can still receive therapy based on the current label for olazarsen and We'll have to see early next year what the label for plosacerin looks like. And so cer certainly an exciting time for patients and, and physicians who, who treat these patients to, you know, after so long not having any tools at our disposal for treating these patients to now having the option of, of soon, hopefully too, if, if the FDA uh, approval process goes as expected for plosacerin. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown, for this excellent discussion. And thanks to our audience for listening. Please remember to take the post-test and complete the evaluation to receive the continuing education credit. Also, if you haven't already, please go back and listen to the previous episodes within the series. Thanks again for listening to MedEd Talks Primary Care. CE credit can be claimed through MedEdTalks.com. For other episodes in this series, search Familial Chylomicronemia Syndrome, a multi-specialty guide to early recognition and novel therapies.